If you love our crypto content or are looking to learn even more about crypto, be sure to check out and subscribe to our new YouTube channel after this video dedicated to all things crypto. Find new videos every week. Be sure to check the link in the description. Guys, great to get you on Real Vision. We only met recently and we just had a fantastic conversation. I thought it's so good to have somebody in Asia talking to us about what's going on because so much of this kind of crypto world is US centric. And I think it's gonna be really interesting picking your brain. So if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves, what you do and a bit of your backgrounds as well, where you came from. Sure, uh, Josh, maybe I'll start, please. Yeah, so my name is Darius. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of QCP Capital. We are a 50 man team uh, based in Singapore. Um, we're crypto, crypto traders uh, that focus a lot on trading in Asia as well as uh, on derivatives. Uh, my background, I started my career at an Asia macro hedge fund called Diamond Asia. Uh, and then I was in BNP Paribas on the FX trading desk uh, in Singapore and then after New York uh, before setting up QCP Capital. Uh, my name is Josh. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders as well. Uh, I do not come from a trading background. I used to be a lawyer, um, but I spent some time in a few different spaces. I started in e-commerce um, in Asia and Latin America, uh, then in mobility and then payments. Uh, so companies like Uber and Gojek and Rocket Internet, um, and that kind of naturally led me into the crypto space. Uh, and it's pretty funny because we started QCP kind of garage band style. We were still at our um, respective jobs and then I remember one day Darius went around the corner, he just kind of quit and walked back because everything's so nearby in Singapore. Um, because you know, crypto is that much more interesting. <laughs> so, Josh, I understand why, you know, because you were kind of already in the kind of digital disruption space, but Darius, what did you see in this whole thing that you left? You know, Diamond is a big and very reputable hedge fund, and then you're in the FX market, you're doing the traditional thing, and then you sidestep. What what was it? So, you know, I, I heard about Bitcoin back when I was in Diamond, but, uh, you know, we didn't think much about it. Even at BNP, you know, when I started trading Bitcoin, uh, I remember there was once I went to, to compliance to declare my Bitcoin holdings and uh, the compliance went back to me. They were like, sorry, what, what what's Bitcoin, right? So, so this was, it was very early back then. Uh, the, the Did, banks, was, uh, was, Dan, was Danny trading Bitcoin at all? Was he into it or not? Uh, not at the time, not at the time. Right. But when we when we first started QCB Capital, we had a long conversation about this, uh, and I think he's been interested uh, ever since. Uh, you know, anything that's very volatile, I think Danny enjoys. So uh, you know, he definitely has, has his eye on it. Um, but for me, I started uh with arbitrage. So back then, you know, the Korean arbitrage was anywhere from thirty to sixty percent. You you're buying Bitcoin in the global market, uh, selling it in Korea at a, at a premium. Uh, getting the money back from from onshore to to uh, from onshore Korea to back to back to Singapore and and that was how we started you know it was a pure arbitrage play um, we were doing that for a year and and that's ex actually how we got our starting capital together. Um, why did the arbitrage exist? Well, I mean, you know, firstly, as you know, in Asia, one of the biggest uh, uh, themes around Asia is capital controls. And um, if you're Korean, uh, it's difficult for you to buy in global markets. You know, you you are typically contained within your own market. Um, and back then in Korea, crypto was this is in 2016, 2017, right? Crypto was crazy in Korea. I mean, people were going going nuts. Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video. I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. Um, and back then in Korea, crypto was, this is in 2016, 2017, right? Crypto was crazy in Korea. I mean, people were going, going nuts on the speculation there. Uh, it became a social problem, right? You know, we, we were hearing that 
the kids in university, you know, you go to university libraries and every, all the kids will be there, the laptops open and they're all trading crypto. No one is studying, right? Uh-huh. Um, and, uh, and, you know, Koreans, they, they, when it comes to speculative fervor, it's real in Korea. Uh, the mom and pops were trading crypto, you know. They had to actually put in measures to reduce crypto trading because it was that, it was that much of a social problem, right? So with that kind of crazy fervor, you know, uh, crypto, Bitcoin, Ether, trading in Korean won, uh, was easily at a premium all the time. It took it took a long time for that premium to die down, and it was a large premium. So, we we, we started trading Bitcoin as purely a financial play uh, before we even knew much about it, uh, and then slowly we got into the deeper into the space. And you know, when we start, started started QCB Capital, we 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 had a more bullish view. But yeah, at the start, it was just a pure arbitrage. And funnily enough, from Korea being the most attractive place to now being one of the most draconian with the taxes on crypto, uh, one of the least attractive places to trade. So, Josh, what did you see in all of this? Why did you hook up with this crazy trader and think that this was something you wanted to do to start QCP Capital? Well, I mean, it was uh, an introduction from Common Friends, and uh, I don't think there was any particular you know, war plan we had written out. We're going to go do this. Um, it was more an opportunity that came along at the right time. Um, and for me, you know, I'd, I'd heard about Bitcoin just by eavesdropping on someone else at a dinner conversation. And that was back in 2014. So I don't feel like my path into crypto was particularly well like played out. It, it, I think it's a pretty typical story. Um, but I think the timing made a lot of sense. And what happened at that, you know, sort of late 2017 picture was, um, you know, I was working at Gojek at the time. And it's if you're familiar with that, it's a super app in Indonesia now. Um, potentially worth 20 plus billion dollars. And um, it's a fourth most populous country in the world. Most people don't look at it uh, as that. And their e-money product, the GoPay, is just so ubiquitous there. It, it just became clear to me that, you know, it's a it's an incredible user feature for people to be happy trading in a closed loop, you know, walled garden environment, the digital rupiah, uh, for like 30 plus different services, like paying your bills, your phone, um, you know, even paying for like food deliveries and all that, that it made so much sense for that to live outside of a, of a closed loop system and blockchain technology just added up to that. So, um, pretty natural move. I remember my boss actually found out about, I was moonlighting and kind of confronted me about it and said, you have to decide. Uh, and so I did, and I, I'm happy I made the right choice there. So what does the business look like now? So what, what is the main business that you guys do? Uh, you know, just again, to give an understanding of ha- how this is working in Asia, what are you guys doing? So two, two main things, right? I mean, uh, we are a uh, trading desk, a flow trading desk. So we buy and sell spot crypto. I think uh, one of the ba- main um, focuses for us there is our Asian presence. So we have a big team in Asia. Uh, and we trade crypto in local currency. So, you know, um, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, uh, and the rest of Southeast Asia as well. Um, I think that's, that's, uh, that's been a niche so you're, for us. So you're trading stuff like Bitcoin, Thai, Thai Bart Cross. So you're yeah. kind of using your FX background and the crypto exactly. stuff. I mean, I always joke that when I first, uh, when, I, when we first started doing this, I, I, did, I felt like I didn't change my jobs. You know, I was still coding Ringgit, still coding uh, Rupiah, you know, same thing. And uh, interestingly enough, you know, a lot of a, a lot of the the that's where the real disruption is that we see um, the, the 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 onshore flow, because the use of crypto there, you know, it, it ironically localizes settlement, meaning that uh, you know these guys could be crypto guys, could be non crypto guys, uh, you know, I mean, just use a real we have some real examples. You have you know alcohol distributors, furniture sellers, you know, in let's say in Indonesia. And they need to pay their supplier in China, right? So the, a typical way for them to do that would be to use their, their IDR or Rupiah, go to the bank, uh, cross a big spread to, uh, from IDR to CMY, um, take two days to settle, ask, get asked a million questions by the bank as to why you're, why you're sending money out. And, uh, you know, so expensive, long time to settle. Uh, what they do is they send, they, they send the IDR to us. It's an instant settlement because it's a local transfer. Um, they cross a IDR to USDT, USDC spread, or Bitcoin spread, um, and in five minutes the settlement is done, right? Because the cross border part of that is done on the blockchain, whereas the the settlement becomes becomes international to local, and that becomes very easy for them. 
So I think that that to us has been the biggest, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, disruption. When, on the when you guys told me this, I was like, of course. I don't think anybody realizes. We see the growth of the stable coins, and nobody realizes that you know we see also the talk of central bank digital currencies, but basically it's playing out in front of our eyes that people have gone to an instant transfer and settlement system, getting around all the regulatory issues and the time and the cost by using stable coins mainly. It's, exactly. it's incredible, right? It is incredible. I mean, this this was happening under our noses three, four years ago when we first started our business, right? Um, we didn't realize how powerful it was. You know, when we when we first started, you know, one of the reasons that got us bullish was this, you know, DCP, the, the, the Chinese renminbi. You know, we, we, we figured that when China put their currency on the blockchain, the rest of Asia will follow. But it played out in a little bit of a different way because everyone was starting to use, you know, USDT for settlements and localizing these settlements. You go to Hong Kong, right? You go to money changes there, physical money changes, and you can trade USDT on the board. Like, you know, you can literally give them Aussie dollars and they will give you a QR code to send you USDT into your wallet. Um, this is three years ago. So, you know, while, while the rest of the world was talking about, you know, whether Bitcoin is going to get adopted. No, no, no. It was being adopted in Asia. You know, there was a, I, I would not like call it this, but it's a shadow banking system that has developed, right? Not just, not, not do you have, not, not, not do you just have localized settlements. You have trade finance. Guys are borrowing USDT, lending USDT. Uh, you know, you have settlements, you have uh, a whole economy so that was forming underneath. So who's the running that, who's running the infrastructure of trade finance? You know, who's making the, prices or is this distributed how's this working in reality so you have exchanges you have otc players like us you know who would do who would who would uh, facilitate these uh, local currency settlements and, and transactions in trade finance um and there's a very big network of them right uh, so you guys you have had basically uh, you guys basically had a yield curve before DeFi was kicking off because, oh, for sure. I mean, uh, yeah, you have a U curve because I mean, uh, it's the it's the you know sort of uh, over the counter type of U curve where where you know you know borrowing rates weekly, monthly. Yeah, we did have that in local currency as well. I mean, so you must have laughed when you saw all of the noise about tether and stable coins and all of this, where everyone's kind of saying all of these numbers they're all false, and you're saying you're looking at Asia, saying, as far as I see, everybody's using it. Oh yeah, I mean, when, you know, you know, the, remember when the uh, first affidavit came out that, that Tether was seventy four percent back? I was like, "Wow, oh, that's fantastic, man!" I mean, you know, it's it's, it's uh, you know, given the amount of adop- uh, amount of adoption and the way it's being used, I mean, what, what makes it different from the US dollar? Uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, it's it's very very functional, uh, and it's very very well used. I mean, another thing that we are seeing, you know, that 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 uh, is starting to appear, and this I find very interesting, right, is. The same way they used to have an onshore offshore art in, in Asian currencies, you know, offshore Thai baht, onshore Thai baht, you know, CNH, CNY, CNO, Thai baht arbitrage. We are seeing that kind of arbitrage between digital and fiat as well. So, you know, uh, you know, as, as guys are starting to release, you know, Sing dollar stable coins uh, or IDR stable coins, ringgit stable coins. I mean, we are seeing that arbitrage where the international market, again, because of capital controls, right? The international market doesn't have access to local currency. And the demand supply dynamics there create a uh, di- dislocation and divergence in liquidity and rates. So it is like the it is like the uh, Asian currencies post the Asian crisis where you have this dislocation. Now you have this digital fiat dislocation, and I think it's just the start of it, right? Because as guys start to adopt it, right now it's more retail, high net worth. They start to adopt these things. As the corporates come in, you know, one day a corporate might a BMW it might say, okay, you know, I need to hedge my tie but I might just do it in local in, in offshore digital Thai baht rather than, than than offshore, you know. And you have a you have probably have a curve there, and you know you start to have a much a like whole, we have the uh, NDF market, right? The non deliverable exactly. forward market. Exactly. I, I think it's starting to form something like this as well, and especially with China rolling out the DCP, I think you're going to have a big digital fiat kind of uh, dynamic going on. Actually, funnily enough, now with these local stable coins, like uh, Indonesia, we seeded a company that uh, got the first uh, onshore crypto exchange license. Eventually, Binance came in as a major investor and partner, and they launched uh, something called the BIDR, the Binance IDR token, local stable coin, which, well, was quiet for a little while, but suddenly with the market coming up, is seeing 20 to 30 million US dollar volume days. Um, so it's picking up, and you can imagine the size of that flow, right? The onshore IDR flow that wants to to trade uh, an IDR stablecoin. 
And so some of this is, I mean, a lot of this is nothing to do with trading cryptocurrencies. It's just payment and settlement rails, I guess. A real use case. <laughs> a real use case. And people are like, where's the use case? And here it is. And it's happening. Wow, the use case, right? yeah. The use case has been here for years. Uh, hmm. But I think more, more than just payment and settlement rails, I think something that's very powerful is, you know, sort of the democratization of yield here. I mean, because, you know, if you are, if let's say you're a local Indonesian, you know, you're holding rupiah, you know, you can put in a fixed deposit, you can put in, in, in certain things, but, you know, creating a digital form of the currency and digitizing the debt uh, democratizes the institutional great finance that, 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 that's available to the masses, right? So right now, if I'm, a, if I'm a normal Indonesian, I'm holding rupiah, I can put it into stablecoin and I can put it into yield farms. You know, I'm able to, to, to get a proper good yield on my uh, currency, um, which I didn't have before. How come the Asian corporates and even retail got so advanced so fast? Because, you know, Michael Saylor on one hand is trying to persuade corporates to use Bitcoin on their balance sheets. Meanwhile, two or three years prior to that, Asian corporates are, are using digital payment systems. Why? Was it just the necessity that caused it? I think, I mean, Josh can probably chip in here, but I think it's probably a bit cultural, right? I mean, I mean, just from experience in the last three years, you know, when I was in New York versus China. So I was in New York, you know, everything is done, a lot of things are done mostly by cash, you know, cash is still a thing. Whereas you go to China, like Shanghai, I mean, I always have, have told this funny story. My, my wife was queuing up for, at the Starbucks in Shanghai uh, and she took out some renminbi notes to pay for a coffee. The entire Starbucks coffee shop stared at her like, uh, we're wondering which village she came from because she's using notes and she's slowing the entire queue down. Uh, no one in China, you go to, no one in China uses actual physical notes, right? They're all tapping their phones or, you know, something, something in. So, so this is like a norm in China, whereas it, it's not a norm in most, of, most parts of the world. So I think with this uh, acceptance of digital payments, you know, uh, crypto came in very easily. It was very natural for, for, for people to make a payment by a QR code or make a transfer by, by a QR code or settlement by a QR code or, you know, by, by a, a wallet address. So I think that, that's partly it. I think it's especially true, especially in developing markets. I wouldn't say this is exclusive to Asia or even Southeast Asia, but anywhere there's a remittance corridor where there's a huge flow of money going back and forth between families, known counterparties, and they're usually using remittance networks and paying that ridiculous fee for it. Crypto has an amazing use case. And that's been said for many years now. But it's just so true here that when stable coins come into play, it just makes so much more sense for them to move over to that quite quickly. And a lot of people don't realize how big the sort of intra-country remittance networks are. So, for example, if you think about the macro structure across Southeast Asia, you, you typically have, um, I'm talking about Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, you have one mega city and then feeder cities and sort of rural to urban migration from there. And everyone makes their money you know, by sending their kids as they grow up into the big city. Um, but eventually those paychecks have to go back out. And a lot of people don't realize that intra remittance is extremely high. It's like 12, 13% cost just to send money back to your family. Um, so you imagine at, at a distance, which is like too close, but also too far. It's like 200 kilometers away, maybe. You're just going to use the local Western Union or you know payment rail service kiosk to, to send that back at those rates. But with crypto, it just makes a lot more sense and that adoption is definitely happening. Um, and I'll add one more to that. Something I found out recently, again, I seem to find out all these things at, at dinner events. Um, I, I was talking to the guy next to me and, you know, you know, Asians, we love to gamble, right? We're talking about sports betting and uh, it's very common, especially here. I'm in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia at the moment and there's tons of sports betting websites across the region. Many of them run out of Malaysia. Um, so maybe this, you know, tends to the more nefarious side of crypto, but an extremely common um, issue is that they can't get the right payment rails in. So they allow you to use Tether uh, to place bets. Um, so I talked to this guy and I, he had no idea he had set up a crypto wallet and was using Tether to bet. But he had just done it because that was what the site required you to do and allowed you to do. And this is like that age group in the mid, late 20s, second gen, maybe going up to take over his like family business. And he's already got a crypto wallet and Tether in it. He's using to, to bet an arsenal, right? But he didn't and know he was using crypto. And he didn't care because it was just how Exactly. He was so happy. That yeah. I mean, on, on, from, from a political level as well, right? I mean, uh, you know, when China, when China launched the DCP, it, well, there was a national campaign to educate the population about the ecosystem. And as part of the ecosystem, 
They were explaining what Bitcoin and Ethereum were, were on national TV last year. I mean, this is amazing. So China kind of understands how this is all being used. And so they're just saying, we just want to attach to that, I guess. They're not trying to stop anything here. They're just like, here's the ecosystem. And the faster that we build out our digital currency, the more likely we can capture market share or, or opportunities, I guess. This is definitely part of it, yes. But I mean, of course, the, the ideal there, ironically, is the opposite of the crypto ideal of decentralization. It's a ultra centralization. <laughs> yes, but it still plugs in. It's, it's an on-ramp and off-ramp to a decentralized world as well. Do, That's correct, yeah. So I'm going to ask a couple of things about stable coins now. So do the Chinese realize that Chinese corporates are using it to get around the bureaucratic nature of capital flows? They do. I think they they, they are very, uh, I mean, they are sensitive about um, um, stablecoin flows outside of their digitized RMB, right? Uh, that China is pretty strict on that. Uh, I think they want to push out their, their, their national, uh, you know, um, DCP uh, uh, digital token, the digital RMB token uh, at, at the expense of local stablecoin trading. Uh, although obviously they can't stop it, it's probably the biggest stablecoin market in the world. Um, so you know they do try and shut down the ramps here and there, but you know, but you know, it, it's difficult in China, of course. Uh, but yes, the, the, the answer to your question is yes, they are sensitive to that, and I think you know they they do want to replace that with the national one. And I'll come on to regulations in a minute. The the other thing that everybody in the West thinks is that all the stablecoins are just used for capital flight, i.e. Chinese politicians taking money out and sticking it somewhere else. How much do you think is actually capital flight versus trade flows in, in all of these countries, whether it's Vietnam or whether it's Malaysia or wh whatever? What, what is your sense? No, we, we, there is definitely capital flight. I mean, you know, there, of course oh. there is. I mean, it happens whether or not it's digital or not. You know, I mean, I, I, once in a while we get these requests and we're like, you know, turn them down. But uh, surprisingly, a lot of our flow is internalized within the country. Meaning that you know we don't have to. I mean, if it's capital flight, it will always be a one-way flow. But the truth is, it's two-way. Uh, you get good two-way flows within the country, and you know you we are able to make make, make two-way markets all the time. So uh, I would say you know some of it is, um, but probably seventy percent or the bulk of it is not. So it's just natural trade flows and and other flows. That's correct. Yeah, Josh, where do you think regulations are going to go in the region now? because of you know the rise of central bank digital currencies and the fact that a lot of people are using it to get around capital controls what are the governments saying what do you how do you think this evolves I think that's a slightly nuanced picture and I'm of course thinking of Southeast Asia here where we focus right that's still 700 yeah. million people an enormous opportunity um, I think that let's take one example look at the Philippines they've had digital currency legislation for like five years. Um, they're, they're like a bunch of trigger happy legislators over there. Well, most of them Harvard educated and they've had that in place for a long time. I'll highlight a local company called coins.ph. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but they've been running a crypto ecosystem uh, with a wallet app for a really long time now. They've got such a good system that you can preload uh, multiple use cases from crypto to fiat to, to your wallet to pay for bus fares, to load your phone, so much that Gojek bought them out. Right, they, they, they're, they're an enormous company. Uh, and they've been doing that for a long time. So they've had the regulatory framework and clarity for some time. There's like multiple licenses issued there. I would say Thailand might be the furthest ahead. There's, there's I think five different types of licenses available from you know being a broker to an exchange operator to uh, a, a token issuer. Um, and I believe, I think I saw an article come out just before this call that the Bank of Thailand just issued guidance on their central bank stable coin. So they're you know miles ahead, I feel, and, and really thinking about about these issues. Um, a lot of this uh, been colored by changing of the guard with new governors coming in um, and, and more and more openness. Uh, I believe they tried to levy a, an, an enormous like withholding tax on, on crypto traders in Thailand and had such massive put back, pushback. They had to backpedal the whole thing. So it's, it's coming slowly but surely. Um, even Indonesia, crypto's uh, classified as a commodity there and regulated by the Commodity Commission. Um, 
I think Singapore, probably one of the most secure and furthest ahead. We are in the midst of licensing with them. Um, you know, they've got a massive backlog of licenses to process, but you know, that just goes to show how much activity there is on shore um, and how much interest there is in using Singapore as a hub. So I feel like the future is very bright in, in, in Southeast Asia in particular. But what about the capital restrictions? Because you know, they're trying to stop currency coming offshore to keep currencies mm-hmm. you know, relatively yeah. stable. But well, I mean, around at, the, at, at the end of the day, you know, the, the fiat gateways, the, the gatekeepers of the banks. So what the what the regulations say and the, what the banks do are two, often two different things. Um, as you know, it's kind of difficult for a lot of crypto companies to open bank accounts anywhere in the world. And, and you know, that's no different here in, in Asia. Um, so quite often you can point to, you know, X, Y, Z, and this is why we're able to operate. And this is our license. But and then you got banks just like, you know, I'm not going to be the guy who lets this money flow out. So a lot of it is levying personal relationships to get accounts open. And at the end of the day, that's your wrap. Without that, it doesn't matter. The fiat can't flow, um, you know, unless they're using more nefarious means. The, the, the banks monitor, I mean, the, the regulators monitor the banking flows as well. So I, I don't think mm-hmm. it's uh, particularly circumventing. Uh, you know, they, they're aware of what's happening. And we, mm-hmm. we often work with the regulator uh, in terms of these flows, so you so you know they're aware of what's happening, and and uh, yeah, I don't think it's particularly circumventing uh, uh, um, capital controls. It's really uh, working within the capital control framework. Um. Now I want to move on a little bit to, okay, we understand this kind of capital flow stuff. How is Asia using crypto? Crypto, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum. What what's going on? What's the adoption like? Who are the players involved? What's going? You know, how's this playing out over there? Well, yeah. So this is the second focus or second biggest uh, uh, focus of our company. Uh, you know, we focus a lot on on derivatives, particularly options and 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 interest rates in the crypto space. Um, as you know, a lot of high net worth family family offices in Asia, they are very focused on uh, yield generation. Um, and uh, that's that's I think that I think is the is the sort of the the uh, um, natural outcome of this ecosystem. So, so if you think about it as a pyramid, right? At the base, you have this adoption layer where it's being used for settlements and trade finance, and Bitcoin as Ethereum, Bitcoin and Ethereum as store of value and as a utility token in the ecosystem become speculative plays as well as uh, uh, you know. Um, a yield place. And, and I think that's what we've been very most active in uh, that we see in terms of growth in Asia, uh, interest in options, uh, interest in, in, in crypto yield. Um, and, you know, we started very early in options about three years, three and a half years ago. Uh, and we've seen our book grow from, you know, zero to a billion dollars uh, and mostly out of Asia as well. And why do people care so much about yield if, the currency, you know, if Bitcoin itself goes up to 100% a year. I've never really understood why you care about, you know, 4% yield when in something that's a 65 vol asset that, that, you know, doubles and doubles again every year. What is the fascination? Well, I mean, of course, the, you know, of course, buying Bitcoin is, is, a, is a natural play as well. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we find a lot of interest in the product that we, we like to call synthetic mining, right? Uh, which is, Instead of buying Bitcoin outright, uh, you know what, what we do, what what we, we we facilitate or what we help to trade is, you know, these guys sell the sell like put options, and they take the premium in, in Bitcoin, so it becomes a way to accumulate Bitcoin with less downside risk, you know. So um, that's why we call it synthetic mining. So it's almost like mining with your capital, uh, and this this is a play that everyone likes because you know you are getting Bitcoin upside at the same time you are less exposed to the volatility. And you are making uh, efficient, you are making efficient yield by selling high implied vols. So you know, as you know, Bitcoin is, in as much as uh, the realized vols are high, the implied vols are even higher. What are, uh, what's the spread? You know, like three month options or whatever. What's the implied versus historic uh, realized? The implied vols, uh, you know, in the last three months, the average implied vol has been about 120, 150. And the uh, realize has been about below 100. I think, you know, in the run up as well, uh, implied vols went up to 250, right? And uh, and realize was about 100 plus. So this That's is a, a situation- be an option market maker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, this, is a, this is a situation you don't find in traditional markets, right? Uh, you know, where, where there's such a- This is why you two have got smiles on- This is why you two have got smiles <laughs> on your faces. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I mean, uh, you know, we've been doing this synthetic mining for, for a few years now. Um, that, that's also and, great because you're creating two-way flow. Because if not, you end up with all call buying or all put buying. Yes. But now you've got selling as people exactly. are, are creating a yield and, and kind of managing their positions. Exactly. Like, so, so you have a market where intensely speculative market where guys are always buying options. Uh, at the same time, because it's the, you push the implied vol so high, it becomes a great way to, to structure products. And I think this this is one of the biggest ways or re- rather the biggest uh, um, segments of crypto going forward, where the, the private banks are salivating, looking at the yields in the space. And uh, you know they're targeting the space for to, to create a new suite of private bank products you know, for high net worth and family offices in Asia. Yeah, because um, Asian investors have been pretty sophisticated in their vol selling strategies over time. I mean, it's not uncommon for them. You know, the, the Japanese yeah. have been doing it for years. The Koreans have been doing it for years. I mean, people are very heavily involved in vol selling products, I guess. Exactly, exactly. Um, most family offices in Asia have a very, you know, they're, they're very exposed to vol selling through private bank products, uh, you know, on, on equities, FX. So this is, this is like second nature to them, but the yields are just like multiplied. And, you know, they're, they're more than happy to take some, some Bitcoin risk on that. So what kind of yields are they getting from this synthetic mining? I mean, yeah. So, um, and what, what's from, the structure? Is it one month options? Is it three month? You know, talk us through it a little bit. Well, the decay curve, uh, the optimal, the optimal area tends to be around two months. Uh, we find that when the decay starts to 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 come down, to to start to increase uh, dramatically. So, two months to three months tends to be ideal. Uh, you know, it's just so they they tend to sell like uh, 30, 40 delta put options rolling, um, rolling every two three months. That's been a great strategy right you know in the last one year you wouldn't get exercised there is better just been going up and just accumulating accumulating more coin so the yield without bitcoin price movement the yield is probably about 40 50 percent with the bitcoin uplift it goes above 100 percent jeez that's an attractive yeah. product and are people packaging this yet or are they still having to kind of come to you guys and and do it in the piecemeal thing or is somebody creating a product to make it easy for them yeah, there have been a lot of products uh, out in Asia. I mean, you know, um, um, but but in the end, they're just vanilla options, right? So the answer is yes. Uh, you know, some some people package it as like a dual currency type product. Um, but selling vanilla puts, I think that, that has been a, a uh, mainstay play for us. I mean, most of these guys come to us to set up uh, managed accounts and they kind of see us as the first door or gateway in. So a lot of them, quite often, these Lisco family offices haven't got their infrastructure set up. So, um, you know, when they... When they step in, they they just want a turnkey solution, a, a place to hold their crypto safely with an institutional provider, uh, and then they want prices. They just want to go off to the races and go. So be it you know vanilla or them just deploying directly. You know we show them price runs and they they pick their strikes, their tenors, or, or sometimes it's a little more managed and we try and guide them with their execution too. And so you and just you add, kind of put that whole thing together for them essentially. Exactly, and just yeah. to add, I mean the the strategy of selling puts. Um, and accumulate, accumulating coin from the premium. In the last one year, the sharp has been 11 or 12. Yeah. This, I mean, this space, I mean, people can't get their heads around what's going on. <laughs> um, and what about in um, Ethereum and DeFi and all of that stuff, or even some of the other protocols? What are you seeing? NFTs, you know, because obviously the buyer of the, uh, the buyer of the Beeple NFT was from Singapore, as far yes, as I'm aware. Uh, well, Canadian, but well, he lives in Singapore. <laughs> right. So, uh, talk well, us I mean, through all of that yeah. as well, the ecosystem overall. So, so, so I mean, the, the way we see it is a bit like a pyramid, right? Like I mean, I mentioned earlier, it's a bit like a pyramid where the base layer is the base layer, the real use of the ecosystem is settlements and trade finance on the blockchain. Second layer is Bitcoin, Ethereum tokens that are part of this ecosystem that are either store of value or being used for transactions within the blockchain. Third layer, then you have derivatives on Bitcoin, on Ether, and other tokens. Uh, you, try, you have a sort of a, a, a rates and ball market. And to me, I think this is the most scalable part of the whole ecosystem going forward. But as you go up the, 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 the uh, pyramid, you know, you start to see some stuff that's more, I guess, more esoteric, right? Um, higher credit risk, probably lower liquidity. Maybe less scalable alpha, but nonetheless very high alpha as we hit the top of the pyramid. So I think you know you start to see like DeFi, uh, on-chain options, um, various 
various uh, other types of DeFi protocols, you know, and then you get to NFTs and whatnot. So, you know, that, that's how I see it, a bit like a pyramid. So, you know, you sort of scale, scale into the, the whole ecosystem um, in terms of uh, amount of liquidity. It's a, it's a liquidity uh, uh, for funnel, as well as, uh, you know, in terms of the kind of uh, risk reward and the returns can be yeah, very high, risk, but more, more kind of risk. It's a full risk curve, you know, you can go as far out the risk exactly. curve as you want. Exactly. Um, what are you seeing in terms of, you know, Asia's obviously a highly speculative market, but are you seeing investors? Are you seeing institutions? Are you seeing adoption of Bitcoin and other uh, tokens at an institutional, corporate, family office level that's not about speculative activity? No, for sure. For sure. I mean, to that end, you know, we we started a asset, asset management arm called the Philip Street Partners. And our partner for, for, for that endeavor is a property developer in Singapore, right? This is as traditional as it gets, you know, property, they own buildings. And in the last one year, they've become addicted to crypto options, right? You know, they've been they've been doing options in not small size, right? Uh, you know, and, and they get addicted to it. Uh, and it's catching on. It's catching on with, with the uh, investment community. Of course, it, it's, um, you know, it's more of the high net worth and family offices first. But we've had talks with the sovereign wealth funds. Uh, we've had talks with these guys who are who are in in the institutional space. They are asking a lot of questions. You know, guys like pension allocators who are curious about what what, they, what what's happening because the pension funds are asking them. You know, what what is this? Can we allocate right? And I think that what they want to see is that what they're looking for, and what we're trying to be for for Philip Street Partners is a bridge between the crypto world and traditional markets because what we see is a huge pool of liquidity, a huge wall of money that is pouring into a space that is nascent and still still small, even with the, with the recent growth. And with that, you're getting this, these liquidity dislocations, right? The, the forward curve is insane. You know, it goes like this and, you know, the funding curves goes up and then it goes, uh, you know, yeah. And uh, the vol curves are also go, going insane. And what they want to see is perhaps uh, strategies that don't, uh, have the same kind of volatility as just outright Bitcoin or Ether. You know, they're, they're not sure about that. But they like to see strategies that capture these inefficiencies, like, uh, you know, capturing fiat digital apps in FX, or, you know, capturing the dislocations in the ball curve and dislocations in the forward curve. And these these kind of dislocations create very, really good alpha, and they tend to be market neutral. Um, I think these are the types of strategies that the institutions are a lot more comfortable with. Now, I know it's not your region, but India seems to be kind of stumbling right now, making the wrong decisions. I mean, if India comes into this properly, you've got another huge market because they do have digital rails within India, uh, much like Indonesia has. Are you keeping your eye on that as well? India was a very big market when we first started QCP. Uh, we had a lot of Indians coming to art India uh, because there was a nice art as well. Um, but in India, if you... Uh, send a, a five thousand us dollars out you know you're gonna get a million questions right and and any any economy where they can you know uh, unilaterally declare your 50 dollar notes as toilet paper overnight that's a bit that's a very big problem for in terms of capital controls uh but like you said it's a sleeping giant um you know a lot of blockchain developers are from india the indian diaspora is huge they have a lot of payment rails, um, but the problem is a regulatory problem, right? The banking is difficult. They are banning and encouraging crypto every six months, you know, the popping. So uh, to me, India can potentially be a market like China. So, uh, you know, if, if the pieces get all uh, are put in the right place, I think, you know, it would be a huge, huge, huge market. So that brings me to the question is, what kind of growth are you guys seeing? You know, I know your business is growing. So, you know, how, how fast is your uh, is your growth and how fast is the ecosystem growth, you think, right now? Because we're we've got to be in the sweet spot for the time being, right? It's exponential. I think uh Singapore has become a hot spot for, for, for crypto. Um, because you know the regular there's a regulatory framework in place. Um being sort of relatively COVID free helps as well. Uh, and uh, in terms of the interest and knowledge that is coming through. Uh, the going the growth curve is straight up. Um, you know, I think you, if you want to put a number on it, like we've probably done all of last year's business in the first quarter of this year. <laughs> and last yeah. year was no and, bad uh, year either. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. No and, uh, and, and, uh, and I think you know, and the people that we're talking to as well. We're no longer mm. you know before this. We're not we're talking to to individuals and you know, guys that are interested and curious. 
now we're talking to banks, we're talking to sovereign wealth funds, you know, we're talking to to, to pension guys. I, I think uh, the, the the kind of conversations we're having, and these guys, and it's no longer like us going to pitch to them and say, you know, would you be interested in this? Is guys are like, hey, you guys know about the space, you know, can we find out more from you? So you know, sort of a table have turn situation, and I, I think the growth will be exponential from here as well. How do you keep on top of all the change in this space? Because there is so much going on, and you know, you're know, you essentially a service provider and liquidity provider to everybody. How the hell do you keep on top of everything that's going on and the opportunities that present itself? Well, I think uh, well, we, very sleep, we sleep very little. Sleep. <laughs> um, but also a phenomenal team, right? I, I, we've said a lot so far, makes it sound like it's just myself and Darius doing all the work, but there's a huge team behind us. How, very how, many, people are, to. how many people are you now? Uh, 50 in total. Wow. Yeah, um, a lot of young, hungry guys, many coming from, you know, different backgrounds, um, some crypto native, some traditional, um, all with a passion for the space. And, and you know, they they add so much to to QCP. Um, you know, it's a big thank you to, to them as well. And I think it's been a phenomenal amount of growth. And I, I think we're really excited for this year. These guys are, are we couldn't, do, couldn't have done it without them. So, so what do you think, final question really for both of you, is what do you think the next phase is? whether it's for you guys or the overall you know, crypto markets that you're involved in, what's the thing you're thinking, okay, this is, what, this is the big prize here that's coming? What do you think that is? Well, last year was a seminal year for expansion in capacity of the space, right? Uh, capacity, you know, we started, started with Paul Tudor Jones coming in and then you have the American corporates coming in. I think the next phase here is full adoption by the corporates. Not just Bitcoin and Ether, you know, of, of course, there's some diversification of treasury there, but the use of digitized dig, digitized debt, um, you know, as a as a corporates use it, use blockchain um, for the daily settlement, daily activities. I think that will institutionalize the space even more. On the investment side, of course, right? Uh, you know, high network family offices will start to, to to look at the space as a legitimate uh, um, asset asset class to to allocate to. Um, but I think the corporates coming in and, and starting to adopt uh, a lot of these uh, uh, blockchain technology, as well as, uh, you know, the, the, the um, as well as with China coming in uh, with the DCP, uh, you know, where, where you start to see CBDCs and, and stable coins start to become a norm. I think, you know, that's where we see the, the, the adoption and the settlement base start to grow bigger. And the the, the the fundamentals the fundamental base of the pyramid gets uh, larger, and I think we built from there. I think the conversations we're having with these people are, as Darius said earlier, just getting more and more comfortable. Um, it's a lot less of an uphill grind. Uh, it's also why we we put so much effort into to getting um, the asset management business up and running as well, because these guys are looking to allocate now, uh, and they're just looking for the right vehicle. So um, you know, we've been thinking ahead for that for some time, um, and I think those conversations are getting a lot more real. Fantastic. Listen, guys, I'm definitely going to hit you up again to, to get an update of what's going on because it's fascinating. And my guess is 90% of all the people who watch this will kind of have their jaw to the floor um, learning that it's not the world that they think it is. It's actually much more advanced elsewhere in the world. Um, and that, that kind of Western-centric view is uh, yet again quite wrong. So thank Thanks you. Thanks for always happy to join. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Yeah, and good luck, guys. Exciting times for you. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.